Praise God. Good to be in the Lord's house and just trust that God will speak to us through his word today. And actually we've entitled this morning's message, Third Generation Christianity. We're living in an interesting time spiritually, but not unique to church history. In fact, I wrote a book on church history about 14 years ago. And emphasizing the fact that history repeats itself. And it repeats itself because we don't learn the lessons that history teaches. But history has proved itself a predictable cycle. And the reason for this is because human nature hasn't changed. The old adage is if we do not learn from history, then we're doomed to repeat it. We, we have to learn the lessons that history teaches. And Solomon made this observation a number of times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And just opening up here in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9, Solomon said, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. So, revivals are no different. History bears out the conditions that exist prior to a fresh move. And as we said, history continues to repeat itself. It often looks as though it's over for the church. But then God sends a fresh wave. Or a sprinkle from heaven. God always has a witness here somewhere. And the church revives. Sometimes revivals seem to come out of nowhere. And yet somebody is there in the background. Somebody believes. There's somebody that has faith someplace. Having completely lost faith. In the book of Acts chapter 14. God always has a witness that he can use. In Acts 14, 17, it says, um, Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. You know, I often reflect about what took place back in the 60s, because at the time, I really thought, this is it. This is the end of the, the world here. The worldly influence, the music, the dress, the hairstyles, the let-it-all-hang-out mentality, and the moral condition of the country was at an all-time low. And the world even reflects with fond remembrance on celebrations like Woodstock. You know, they're looking back and say, oh, this was great. Which to me represents the lowest moral ebb of our time in history up to that time. Because I think as a nation, we have presently surpassed the debauchery of the 60s. However, my point is this. It was at that time, around 66, 67, when God began to move afresh. And from very strange sources, places even, it was beginning in Catholic prayer meetings and Anglican prayer meetings and places that you'd never expect revival to break out, but uh, you'd never expect God to move there. But believe it or not, it happened and it had an effect upon our society. Even some of the psychedelic dress changed. Do any of you remember the psychedelic days? Crazy dress and crazy ties. But there has been a, la- a few, there's been a few sprinklings since that time. But we're presently living in a generation that has not seen. The generation that was born in the 90s and, of course, the millennials, you know, they haven't seen some of the supernatural moving of the, the spirit like some of us older ones have. And I've been hearing this from different quarters, different people. 
But we're living in a generation of a younger generation that has not seen, they haven't seen some of the things we, we have seen. And, you know, I, as I said, I've been hearing this from different places, but even other ministers have been relating this same tone that they're hearing from different people. Where are the mighty works? You know, where are the miracles that you speak of? Well, it's true. You know, there's a generation of young people that have never seen a supernatural moving of the Spirit. But do you know something? This is nothing new. Because other generations have said the same thing. They said, where are the miracles that we've heard our fathers speak of? And as we said, history repeats itself. And we want to just encourage faith today, but let's back up into the, the dark ages of the Bible, age of the Judges. And in Judges chapter 2, let's go back to Judges chapter 2, and we're looking at third generation from revival. Judges 2, 7, but we want to encourage faith this morning. Judges chapter 2 and verse 7, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. So... People served the Lord all the days of Joshua. He was a mighty man of valor. They saw, you know, victory after victory. They saw, you know, walled cities come down with a shout. They entered into the promises that were given to them, entered into the inheritance that God had spoken of. And their children remembered this as well. They remembered those acts probably the excitement that their parents had as they were talking about the great victories and so on that were taking place. But then the Joshua generation is gone and the generation, you know, the children of the Joshua generation were gone. And still in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, it says... uh, And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Here's a new generation, and everything that they had heard was just, it was just hearsay. They'd never seen it. They heard their parents perhaps speak of them, but they hadn't seen it. I think Pastor Bailey said years ago, that usually it's the third generation that backslides, and it's very scriptural. It's the generation from revival. The third generation from revival usually starts to go back, and I'm afraid that's where we are spiritually today. And so, you know, we're living in a generation of Christendom that has not seen. Now, Going back into the 50s, our family got into Pentecost, and it was the tail end of what they called the the Latter Rain movement, which is a misnomer because it really was not the the Latter Rain, but that's what they called it at the time. It was a real move of God, and God was moving in a wonderful way, evangelization, there was tent meetings, there was healing revivals, and all of that. And they call it the Latter Rain Revival, but really was not the Latter Rain. And there were times when I was a young boy uh, where I saw the whole front of the church out under the power of God. In fact, there was a service there where a little girl died. Now, I wasn't old enough to verify that she was really dead. She turned purple, and the church gathered around her and prayed, and she revived. And, um, you know, so I'm not going to say yay or nay on that, but uh, they affirmed that that's what happened. 
But since that time, through the 70s and 80s, we've seen the Spirit of God move across audiences. You can almost see the Spirit of God moving. Like wind blowing through the trees. You know, sometimes you see the wind move through the trees and and the leaves are clapping and you could see the Spirit of God moving through the congregation like that. You could see the wind of the Spirit just going as people are clapping and you could just see God moving right through the congregation. It's very awesome. In fact, I remember when we dedicated Zion, well, it was Hebron at the time, but I remember that took place. You could just see the, the wind of the Spirit just moving through the, the congregation. Very wonderful. I was ministering in a large church in Indonesia, thousands of people in audience, and they were all singing in such unison, there was such unity there, and that the power that was being emitted from this audience was awesome. In fact, I can only describe it like this. It felt like a freight train was coming through the the congregation, it was such power. It just felt like a freight train was moving through the congregation. But, I mean, we've seen some of this. Um, and we've heard testimonies of people that were healed under our ministry as well. One minister stopped at our house one time. He was en route someplace. And he said that God had spoken to him to stop and wanted me to pray for him so that he could receive his healing. He was suffering from severe kidney stones. He stopped, we prayed for him. He continued on and gave me a call a short time later. He said, they're gone. And we have seen some miracles. Uh, you know, I don't want to get into all of that, but um, we have seen miracles take place even in our own ministry. But we're still in the book of Judges here. And chapter 6, and we're looking at the third generation from revival. And here's the man Gideon, and he has a visitation from heaven in verse 12. Judges 6, 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Now, remember that God calls things the way that he sees them, even if they're not. When God says something, he's calling this man a mighty man of valor, even though he probably did not esteem himself to be a mighty man of valor. But the Lord sees something in this man that's going to be, and he calls things by his foreknowledge, even though they may not be at the present. And just for a reference on that, we could note Romans four, seventeen. This is Abraham. And it says, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. The Lord calls things the way they're going to be, even if it looks impossible, which it did in Abraham's life. The Lord said he was going to be a father of nations, and that was at a time when he and Sarah were both beyond the capability of producing children. Well, let's go on to Judges six thirteen, And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if thou... If the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all the his miracles which our fathers told us of? Sound familiar? You know, other generations before revival saying the same thing. Where are all the miracles that our fathers told us of? We don't see anything. But you see, we're living in a similar generation a generation of Christendom that has not seen. They've heard of these things happening, but never really seen it. Well, do you remember the words of Christ when he said, Blessed are they that believe and have not seen? 
That comes from John twenty twenty nine. But, you know, when I travel, a lot of times I just ask the Lord for a word. I like to have some kind of confirmation, and I like to hear from God, you know, and I'm en route before I leave, too. But anyway, it's almost... I almost invariably open up to the same passage in Mark, which says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. Every time I travel, I get those verses. And so that's the way we have to go out. We have to believe that God can do anything. Amen? Amen? In spite of what is there, we have to believe that God can do anything. That comes from Mark 9.23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Well, God wants us to believe in spite of what we see. And just remember this, believing is a step to faith. Believing comes from human volition. We can choose to believe or not. And God gives faith to who? To those who believe. Amen? God gives faith to those who believe. You know, believing says, I know that God can do it. Faith says, I know that God will do it. God gives faith to those who believe. Faith comes from God. So we've seen things happen overseas that don't happen here. And part of that resides in the fact that they simply believe. That God is going to do it. They believe. And, you know, I preach perhaps things here, preach on healing here. Nothing happened, but then people who've listened to it on YouTube overseas, you know, later got back to me and said they were healed, healed listening to the message. It's amazing the difference when you, I mean, geographically. And... We have encountered a few things that overseas that you don't generally see around here, like demon possession. Back a few years ago, I was in India, and they asked me to pray for this woman, demon-possessed. And, um, you know, so we were in a side room, just myself and another minister, and this woman, we started to pray for her, And she fell on the floor and was wreathing and, you know, some of what you see in the scripture, just rolling on the floor. But she came clean. She sent me a letter, in fact, a couple letters afterwards. And, you know, you don't see that so much here, although I think you're going to see more of it in the future. But I've had people fall out on the street just talking to them. I never laid hands on them, never touched them. I'm just talking to them about things of the Lord, and they fell out under the power. Um, I remember one one girl, she she kind of surprised me because I, I just, you know, generally people, when they fall under the power, they usually go backwards, but she kept fell forward. So, I mean, I wasn't expecting that. She fell out, and she fell right, never put her hands out or anything. She fell right down on the concrete, her face, you know, never put her hands out or anything. Just went down on her face with a whack on the concrete. And I thought, oh, my God, there's going to be blood flowing. And a minute later, she got up laughing. And, you know, she was filled with the spirit. But, you know, we can tell people that. But people say, well, we haven't seen it. Well, listen, it's coming, too. Even things beyond what we've seen. But. Just recently, some of us have been reflecting on some of the ministries that came through, you know, our church in the early beginnings back on Pittsburgh Avenue, back in the late 70s and early 80s. People like Stanley Hammond and Michael Mingo. I mean, these were real prophetic ministries. And C.L. Moore and... Barbara Massey and Jewel Courtney, you remember some of those people? Which gave us profound and accurate words, too. But um, we need to see a release of some real prophetic 
ministries again. Then, of course, we had the privilege of sitting under a true apostle, too, didn't we? Pastor Bailey, I mean, he is unique. In all of my life, I've never met anybody that even comes close to him, but, you know, I might remind you and myself that it was 40 years ago today, on this very day, December the 5th, that my brother Paul and I were ordained in Myrtle, and some of you were there. You were there, Carol, all right. Carl, you were there. Debbie Clark was there. My family was there. You weren't around at that time, no? Okay, no. Before your time. Uh, That was 40 years ago today. It was an awesome service. Um, And we still have other connections that are still in the ministry, like Mark Keenum and others that were there at the time. They're still with us 40 years later, but it was 40 years ago on this very day. But the point that we're making is that we're presently living in a time like Gideon. And so here's the younger generation saying, where are the miracles? Where are these ministries you're talking about? Where are they? They're coming. They're coming, and it's like every other generation. History repeats. Things get dry. Things get dead. Here's a generation that hasn't seen it. But believe anyway, because it's coming. Believe. So are we going to be people of faith? I hope so. We want to believe all of the promises that God gave to us. Are we going to continue to plant? Pastor Frank brought out Wednesday night. Are we going to... Break up the fallow ground until he come and rain righteousness upon us, as it says in Hosea. But you see, we have to continue to believe and to work and to plant until he comes. Because if we don't, we're not going to see a harvest. We continue to believe and to continue to sow. And invest. But it's also like a truth I brought out the other night from Ecclesiastes 11. Because if we take a look around at the conditions, the spiritual conditions, and we focus on that, then we quit sowing. And we say, well, what's the use? Now, listen to this now. Ecclesiastes 11.4 It says, um, he that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap. Well, if we look around at the spiritual conditions, around spiritually and in this nation, the evil on every hand, if we focus on the spiritual decadence around us, then we, we cease to plant and to invest, and then we don't see a harvest either. So we have to continue. Amen? We continue to do what we're doing. And we want to continue to raise up ministers, you know, from this group too. We want to develop people because when the harvest comes, believe me, there's always a shortage of ministry of real ministry. So we can't focus on the angry clouds and the winds of opposition and unbelief. And like I said, if we focus on the spiritual decadence uh, all around us, then we're going to cease to plant and to sow, and we're not going to see a harvest either. You're with me here? So the greatest harvest is yet to come. There's a promise of a harvest coming, that, and it's, it, it will be the truly the latter rain harvest, but it will be beyond anything that has been hitherto. The greatest revival, the greatest outpouring, greatest acts of power. 
So let's forget about the adverse winds and the threatening clouds and let us continue to sow and to witness and to invest into the things that are eternal. Now here's another verse in Ecclesiastes 11. And I'm looking at this one from the International Standard Version, the ISV. And it says, Sow your seed in the morning, and don't stop working until evening, since you don't know which of your endeavors will do well, whether this one or that, or even if both will do equally well. Do you have that up there, the ISV? Oh, you don't have the ISV. Okay. Keep sowing, keep investing in spite of what you see. So, another amazing thing about miracles and supernatural things is that even when they come, people can acclimate to them. They get so used to seeing miracles that, you know, they get become insensitive to them. You see this with the disciples. I mean, Jesus actually had to admonish his disciples on more than one occasion because of their insensitivity and their lack of faith. Even after they had seen one miracle after another, you know, they're still doubting. Well, for example, in Mark's gospel in chapter 6, 5,000 people were fed. And then you get to Mark chapter 8, and they come across a similar situation with 4,000, and they're saying, well, well how are we going to feed these people? Well, they just saw God feed 5,000. Why couldn't he feed 4,000? And so um, you see where the Lord challenges his disciples. And they had seen, they were in a revival atmosphere. Even after he rose from the dead, he, he is chiding the disciples on the Emmaus Road because they didn't believe the women concerning his resurrection. Right? He said, oh, fools and slow of heart. How come you don't believe the scriptures? See, we don't want to get into that rut. Mark chapter 8 and verse 4. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men uh, these uh, men with bread here in the wilderness? And see, these people had seen miracles. And they still had this disbelief. They saw, but they still did not believe. Jesus said in John 4, 48, Except you see miracles, you will not believe. But note John 12, 37. John 12, 37, it says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? You need miracles to believe, and then even after they see them, they still don't believe. Well, let's choose to believe whether we see them or whether we don't. Well, let me just wrap this up. Um, you know, let me just share a little testimony here uh, going back about 50 years ago, because I was reading a portion of Scripture from Luke chapter 4 and Jesus is ministering in his hometown, Nazareth, and he, what he says incites this crowd. You know, they, they want to destroy him after what he said. I've been in Nazareth before. I've seen some of those cliffs that they wanted to push him over. But Jesus uses the times of Elijah as an example. And he says, there were many widows who were hungry during the times of Elijah. But Elijah wasn't sent to any of them. He was sent to somebody outside the kingdom. A lady up in Sarepta, up in Lebanon, actually. Wasn't sent to, sent to anyone within the kingdom. And then he uses Elisha as another example. Many lepers in Israel, time of Elisha. But it was somebody outside the kingdom that got healed from leprosy. And, of course, those comments really incited anger from those who were listening to him. 
and you know they wanted to destroy him. They wanted to take him up and push him over the the ledge. But you know those words incited me, because. I was saying to the Lord, Lord, if nobody else wants to get fed, I do. If nobody else is interested in being fed, I do. If nobody else is interested in being cleansed, I do. Let me be the one. I want to be one that gets fed. I want to be the one that gets cleansed. You know, I think we almost have to have that attitude, too. Lord, I want to be fed. Lord, I want to be cleansed. And, you know, what's interesting today is that Even in the ministry, we're seeing people outside the established church in other countries that haven't been raised in a Christian atmosphere that are receiving and they're being ministered to and they're being healed and they're being blessed. And what's the church in our nation doing? I mean, it's I'm just saying that in a general sense. You understand what I'm saying? That God is... Even going around, it's kind of a repeat of history right there. God is touching people in other nations. And, you know, we want to just challenge our our faith this morning. Do we believe what God has said? Do you think that the Lord is going to leave the church in the state that it is and he's coming for a, a dilapidated, worn out, beat down church that you see today? I don't think so. But I believe that God wants to challenge our faith and believe the things that he's spoken. It is a time of sifting, but does our faith still hold? Do we still believe? So let us not be weary and well-doing, because in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Amen? Amen? See, we're living in that that time of the third generation that hasn't seen, and we haven't seen anything in the long, things have been dry. But when God moves again, believe me, we'll be looking for space and places to put people and for uh, teachers and counselors and things that can handle what's coming. That's why we want to continue to sow and to plant, and to believe in spite of what we see. Look at the conditions, look at the wind, the adverse winds, look at the condition of our nation, how evil things have become. That's the way it was back in the 60s and other times in history as well. So let us not be weary in well-doing, but let us believe God and let us see that harvest that has been promised Amen.